The Zero Width Law of Thermodynamics Temperature After the first and second laws of thermodynamics were developed and named, it became clear that they relied on a more fundamental law. That Zero Width Law defines temperature and how to measure it. It is more fundamental than the first and second laws since temperature is used in those. But since the first and second laws were already named, the zeroth law was given its name to show that it should precede the first and second laws. The zeroth law can be stated a number of ways, including temperature is a property of objects such that when objects are placed in thermal contact with one another, heat will flow between them until the temperature of each is the same. Objects from which heat flows, and that's the arrows here, are at a higher temperature than objects into which the heat flows. Using the zeroth law, rank these objects from hottest to coldest. The answer will be on the next slide. Heat flows from A to B, that's this here, going from A to B, and from A to C. So A has the highest temperature. Heat flows from B to C, over here, so B is at a higher temperature than C. So the temperature of the three objects ranked from highest to lowest is A, B, C. A common misconception is that temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of an object's particles. However, that is only true for ideal gases, but it's mistakenly applied to all objects. The relationship between an ideal gas's temperature and the average kinetic energy of its particles is part of what makes an ideal gas different from real gases. It also makes it different from other states of matter, such as liquids, solids, and plasmas. The zeroth law defines temperature for all states of matter. Thermal equilibrium is also defined by the zeroth law. When two objects are placed in thermal contact, Right, so the example we showed earlier is they're touching each other like that. Heat will flow between them until they reach the same temperature. At that point, the objects are in thermal equilibrium. The zeroth law provides the basis for creating thermometers. The thermometer is put in thermal contact with the object whose temperature is to be measured. Heat flows between them until they reach thermal equilibrium, at which point the heat ceases to flow. Then, the zeroth law stipulates that the objects are at the same temperature. Thermometers are unique in that they have some property that varies in a predictable way with temperature so its temperature can be read. That allows the temperature of the object to be measured. Here are some thermometers that use different properties to measure temperature. An ideal gas thermometer indicates its temperature through the gas's pressure. A mercury thermometer reads temperature by measuring the thermal expansion of mercury. A thermocouple reads temperature due to the voltage generated between dissimilar metals at a given temperature. These do not define temperature, but they do allow us to measure it. They work because they have a measurable property that depends on temperature, and after coming into thermal equilibrium with an object, allows the object's temperature to be determined. In each case, though, the thermometer must be calibrated. Repeatable temperature-dependent physical phenomena are key to calibrating thermometers. The phase changes of water at standard pressure have been historically important for this purpose. For example, any object in thermal equilibrium with a mixture of liquid water and ice at standard pressure has a temperature corresponding to the freezing point of water. Any object in thermal equilibrium with boiling water at standard pressure has a temperature corresponding to the boiling point of water. And let's go ahead and underline that. So you've got the freezing point of water and the boiling point. No thermometer is necessary if you just need to know that an object is at one of those two temperatures. Place the object in the water, and when the object reaches thermal equilibrium, it will be the temperature of the water. But if you want to measure intermediate temperatures or measure the temperature of an object without changing its temperature to match one of those two calibration points, you need to calibrate the thermometer, and we'll discuss that next. But first, it's worth noting that any thermometer will change the temperature of the measured object. 
unless they begin at the same temperature. That's because heat flows between them, changing the temperature of both until they reach equilibrium and an intermediate temperature. Thermometers are designed to minimize this effect, but it may need to be taken into account. Here's how to calibrate a mercury thermometer, but the same procedure applies to any thermometer in principle. First, place it in a mixture of ice and liquid water at standard pressure. After it reaches thermal equilibrium, mark the length of the mercury in the tube. Then repeat this with boiling water at standard pressure, making a second mark. If we call those marks zero, that would be for the ice and liquid water, and 100, boiling water, and have 100 evenly spaced degrees between them, that's the Celsius scale. If the marks are called 273.15 and 373.15, draw the hours there again, and have 100 evenly spaced degrees between them, that's the Kelvin scale. Finally, if the marks are called 32 and 212 and have 180 evenly spaced degrees between them, that is the Fahrenheit scale. This is how the three temperature scales, Fahrenheit, Celsius, and Kelvin, compare to one another. Comparison is made by looking at the same physical phenomenon, water's boiling point, water's freezing point, and then all the way down to absolute zero, which is the lowest temperature, and look at the scales. We have 212 for Fahrenheit, 100 degrees Celsius, 373 Kelvin. And then here's the next, which we talked about on the previous page, and then absolute zero we didn't, but just by extrapolating, we come up with those values. While any of these temperature scales can be useful, you will be studying cases in which only the Kelvin scale can be used, and we'll make sure we tell you about that. In those cases, when given temperatures in Celsius degrees, you will need to convert to Kelvin. We will not be using Fahrenheit degrees in this course, so you won't need to do that conversion. The size of the degrees in the Kelvin and degree Celsius scales are the same. They are just offset by 273 degrees. Converting between those two scales is just a matter of adding or subtracting 273 degrees. So we have a Celsius reading. You add 273 to get it in Kelvin. And if you have Kelvin and you want to go to Celsius, you subtract 273. We'll probably be going this way most of the time. A temperature of 16 degrees Celsius, therefore, is 16 degrees Celsius plus 273 and it is 289 Kelvin. And notice, you don't say degrees for Kelvin, you just say Kelvin. 